top of the morning. How are you? Um, on this, the uh, first three-day weekend of the school year, it's a little, a lot of vacationing going on, which is fabulous. Uh, if you're guests with us, welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. Uh, very quickly, the Panama Derby deal. Uh, we talked on Vision Weekend about how Mike's working really hard at, uh, I don't know, bringing more creativity to what they're doing down there. And I believe next month, the virtue that they're working on next month is creativity. And so, right, five weeks, there's five Sundays in October this year. And so they're going to work on creativity. And as they do that, kind of the unfolding of this Pinewood Derby car will follow. Uh, it's free, of course. Um, what they're saying there is if you're, you know, like in my case, I've got a five-year-old who won't qualify because he's not with the elementary or the, yeah, the elementary K through fifth grade people over across the alley. That was a terrible announcement. Nonetheless, he's left out, which is kind of a big deal. So uh, what Mike is, the way he's accommodating that is they're doing age appropriate building stuff as well, but also your family can buy one of those cars and take it home with them for the weekend and you can hack your finger off or help them or get frustrated as you help them because you can never quite make it look like the picture, right? Anyway, and then James, if you missed Vision Weekend, the guy on the announcements, uh, we hired him effective September 1st at about uh, three-quarter time or so, 30 hours a week, to uh, lead and pioneer in high school stuff. And our desire there is just to add value to the high school culture and our community, and so hence the partnership with Young Life, because he's worked with Young Life for a long time, and we're really thrilled about what he's bringing to the table. He'll preach next weekend. So if you don't like this morning, good news. I won't be here next week. Well, I will, but uh, James is going to unpack kind of what organic, uh, which is a series we're in, what organic uh, student ministry looks like and what we're visualizing, what he's visualizing there. Okay. So on that note, I'd like to get you thinking about the uh, word phrase in play, particularly as it pertains to sports analogies, for I am accustomed to being um, using too many sports analogies. All right, like many a kid standing up to bat, whether in t-ball or Plain Legion, has heard people say, uh, come on, Billy, just put the ball in play, right? Like parents, uh, teammates, come on, Johnny, just, just put the ball in play. Or, um, come on, just put the ball in play, right? Like it can come in several different tones, but there's this idea of just, just and what we're saying there is there is this vast field in front of you. Just hit the ball and put the ball on the field. In fact, I, I need someone to throw me some pitches. Andrew, would you? We're going to try this. Now, last service, this didn't go so well. So... I've been telling myself all week that I cannot swing the bat. I have to bunt the ball. And lo and behold, I hit a line drive right to about where you're sitting with a baby in your lap. But it was James. And so uh, God protected us from the attorney. So you've got to open those up and give me some pitches. Ready? Remember, you're not trying to strike me out. Which you just did. See, now I've got a complex about not hitting the ball too hard. Give me another one. Right, so when you hear it, put the ball in play. Keep, keep them coming. I'm going to try to do two things at once. Uh, wow, I, w I was a pitcher. <laughs> Not only did I hit the biggest man in the room, I think I hit him in a bad spot to hit him. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Welcome back from Iraq. Bam! Right, like what we're appealing to in that whole phrase is like there's this big field out in front of you. Like you can hit it anywhere out there. Just hit it somewhere out there and force someone to, to make a play. Force them... Uh, to, to make a catch, to field the grounder. Uh, we use this phrase in tennis as well. Anybody play tennis? I don't either. I went to Laurel. They had a low budget. Um, right, like when the, when the server is holding the ball, the ball is not in play. When the server hits the ball, the ball is now in play. Right? And as long as it stays in between these rather arbitrary lines and the rules are followed, the ball continues to be in play. That one's for you, Joe. Uh, we use it in basketball. Right? <laughs> I was on the bookshelf for a while, <laughs> right? Like we, we passed the ball in. Good job. Just hang on to that. Actually, you should throw it back right in front of Lenny's guitar. Yeah. Uh, right? Like when the ball person is inbounding the ball, they're putting the ball in play. And again, we've got this court with these clearly defined lines around it. And as long as it stays between those lines, uh, we use it in golf. I don't golf, do you? But, but in golf, there's this really... <laughs> You guys think I'm crazy. <laughs> There's this really big field, and within reason, the ball stays in play no matter what you do with it, unless you're as bad a golfer as I am. Uh, ever, watched, ever watched four- and five-year-olds play soccer? Ever been a part of the Y Soccer League? Um, what you realize if you have, 
um, is you have because you coached my son's team. Wow, there you are. Um, oh, what, what you realize if you've ever watched them play is that there are these lines painted on the grass. We call them out of bounds. They mean nothing to four and five year olds, right? And so the first soccer practice uh, or the first soccer game, parents kind of stand on one sideline because that's what we're accustomed to doing and watching a game of soccer until the first time the ball goes out of bounds because um, while everyone else assumes that we all understand that there's a boundary to where that ball can go, uh, four and five-year-olds don't understand that, right? And so 100 yards away from the field, they're still playing soccer. <laughs> Seen this? Which is why one of, the greatest, um, one of the greatest pieces of evidence of collaborative leadership is when you go to the second soccer game of the season because the parents, without even having to tell anyone that we're going to do this, they form a border around the field so that the ball is kicked back in because the kids, they don't know that there's such a thing as out of bounds. They just know like ball, 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 right? It's like squirrel, which oddly enough, I had my neighbor knock on my door a week ago and ask me if I'd, they just moved here from, I don't know, some little town by Missoula. And she said there was a squirrel in her kitchen. And there was. I caught it with my fishing net. It was, it was really great. <clears throat> so we started this series uh, last week, a series that we're calling Reorganic. And, and re simply re, uh, refers to the idea of responding to something, and organic is short for, I picked it up, I have to take a drink, even though I'm not thirsty. Um, organic refers to this phrase that we've been passionate about literally from day one of Narrate, which is this idea of organic kingdom bringing. Because the foundation upon which uh, we feel like God called us to plant this was that we'd be a community that gathered and scattered. And what we mean by that is we want to gather well. Like, we want to hit people in unspeakable places with wiffle balls from stage, right? Like, um, we don't really... Sorry. <laughs> um, but we want to gather well because we think this is relevant to us in our own pursuit of Jesus. We think it's relevant to our relationships. We think it helps us find friends that we connect with. And we don't all have to be best friends, but it's nice to have some friends. Uh, we think it's uh, relevant to just have common story to tell and to celebrate what God is doing and to imagine uh, the kingdom of God and what it could look like in Helena. And yet we're constantly reminding ourselves that this has value, but this isn't the goal that there's these other six days in the week, that this is one-seventh of it. And the other six days, uh, that's where the real work of following Jesus happens. Because being kind to each other here, uh, easy. No matter how spiritual you are or aren't. Uh, being kind to each other at Walmart, borderline impossible. <laughs> right? Like, uh, being kind or, or, or being generous here, easy. Serving here, somewhat easy. Uh, but when you get out there, that's where the hard work happens. And we've just observed that Jesus wasn't much of a churchy. Uh, he was someone who was a part of a larger community, and they spent their time scattered in a community, uh, telling a different kind of story, a different a kind of story about a different way of being human. And what we've worked really hard at in the organic kingdom bringing peace is that uh, like when it comes to, to growing in our relationship with Jesus, like venues like this are helpful, and reading books are helpful, and going to Bible studies, that's helpful. So is serving a neighbor. So, so is being a good employee. And when you think of spiritual growth, like there's the gathering, but there's also the scattering. And when it comes to serving people, yeah, there are great organizations out there with crosses in the logo, and you can serve them, and that counts as serving God. And yet what often is overlooked is the opportunities that life affords us in the everyday. Because of where we live, because of the neighborhood, uh, that's the same thing, because of where we work, because of the relationships we have and the skills we possess, there are all kinds of opportunities. I guess one way you could say that uh, because you've got to come up with a reason for why you're hitting balls off the stage, uh, is to say that, like, everything's in play. That, that there's no sacred, secular lines. That those were drawn uh, by well-intentioned peoples during the culture wars of the 70s and the 80s. But there is no sacred. There is no secular. According to Jesus, every corner of culture is in play when it comes to God's desire to flood that space with his redemption. And central to organic kingdom bringing is this calculated risk of going, can a community exist by decentralizing itself? By saying this is valuable, but it's not the goal. What's even more valuable is when you get away from this and serve people in ways that you aren't celebrated. Because we all like the big sexy serving things like Ales for Trails and dodgeball tournaments. But, you know, it's being the best employee in the office that probably makes a bigger difference. And so that value is so central that two years into being a church, we said, let's not lose that. In fact, let's talk about that. Let's develop that. Let's add some more handles to that. Let's not just assume that we all know what it means. Let's spark creativity in one another. And so last week, we started talking about compassion and just noted that humanity changed once this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, lived and died and rose. 
That it's easy to think that compassion is an intuitive human trait, but Jesus introduced it to the human scene in ways that hadn't been before, and by seeing in people the divine spark, he helped us imagine an entirely different way of being human, of, of being fueled by the grace of God, and loving people seen beyond uh, titles and labels and stereotypes and sin, and seeing in them a child, prince or princess, if you will, of the Lord. This morning... Uh, we're going to continue, therefore, along that theme of reorganic. Next week, organic uh, student ministry. This week, I'm going to talk about. Well, I just want to ask this question: Like, what if your vocation was in play? I mean, what what opportunities, because of the work that you do, are are in play? What what chances are there for kingdom bringing because of where you spend the majority of your time? And I guess I have to admit to you that this morning I'm going to kind of deviate from what would be a much more purist view of vocation. Vocation literally comes from the Latin word vocare. It literally means to call. And so if we're going to get really literalistic about the word vocation, we're speaking about that idea that God made you specifically for something. Some of you are in jobs where you get to do that. Uh, most of us aren't. And until we are, uh, we, can, we, we can kick and scream and demand it. We can wait for it. Or we can ask this question, what if, what if the space that I occupy occupationally, what if the space that I occupy as a stay-at-home parent or as a student, as a sixth grader or as a senior in college, what if the space I occupy with the majority of my time, what, it's, what if it's literally the very space that God wants me in? And it's there that he wants his redemptive love to crash into the earth through you. In other words, uh, what if no matter how much you like or don't like your boss or your school, your coach, what if that's where God put you? And for more than a paycheck, like because he's got redemptive purposes through you for that space. Now, uh, what I have to admit to you is I really struggled uh, with prepping for this weekend, which you don't care about, but I do, and I like to cry. Um, I couldn't figure out why I was struggling so much, because the Broncos won on Sunday, so certainly it should be a good week, right? Um, and then Thursday night in the conversation with my wife, it, it kind of occurred to me why. It, it occurred to me why because uh, your world's not mine. And, and I don't necessarily like that. But, but as much as I value around here, like wrestling stuff through and being on the same page and kind of coming at things from common ground, um, like I've worked for a church since I was 19 years old. And so I can theorize a lot and I've got these things that I see in God's story that I think are central and vital and could become really, really awesome if fleshed out. And yet in many senses of the word, I don't have the opportunity to live them out. When I was 19, I started following Jesus. Shortly thereafter, I met a guy named Fred who sold insurance. And he helped me understand that I was made to teach, to learn and to share what I was learning. And so I decided that I was, uh, began to think that maybe God was calling me to work for a church. And in fact, shortly thereafter, through a series of relationships, I kind of got the dream offer that I thought was the dream offer, just short of 20 years old, where a guy named Vern, who um, was leading a student ministry, offered for me to come on and uh, intern on a, in a youth ministry, to be on staff at a church. And it was one of those, like, just got the dream invitation, and then uh, in the next few days, it became clear to myself and Teresa, who I was dating at the time, that, that I should say no to that. And the tension in me, and the reason why, in fact, I remember saying to Fred, Fred, uh, I kind of just want to lay in the weeds like you do. And I didn't mean that in any kind of a negative sense. Uh, what I meant was, like, you follow Jesus, and you don't get paid to follow Jesus. And you don't read your Bible because you're supposed to, but because you want to. And you don't disciple people because you have to, because you get paid to, but because you desire to. And you don't serve people, and on and on and on and on. And I was aware then uh, of, of what I'd be giving up should I go to work for a church. And so I didn't. And then three months later, having already started a degree, which I eventually finished in secondary education at MSU, the fine institution of Montana State University, Billings, the Yellow Jackets. I think they have some sports teams. Anyway, I eventually came back and said yes. And I say all that to say, uh, I envy you. And, and this morning, uh, rather than kind of get to go like, here's been my experience, I much more have to go like, here's what I see. And I don't like to take this posture. But, but, but I envy that you have the opportunity uh, to follow Jesus not because you get paid to. And I'm not saying that's why I do, right? You get what I'm saying. But because there's these opportunities, uh, I guess I just want to kind of get you thinking about and maybe spark some creativity with regards to your vocation. Like what if, it was, what if it was in play? 
What if it was right where God wanted you, right? What if, what if it was right where God's redemptive love wants to flood the planet through you? His power, his grace, right there. That office, that kiosk, that classroom, that team. Heard of some people in New York City who followed Jesus and their heart was broken for the uh, prostitution scene in that city. And it was broken not from a purely moralistic sense and, you know, that type of a sense, but just from they, got, they gained an understanding of, like, what went on in the soul of a prostitute and, and the, the brokenness of the system and the abuse of the system. And, and their skills were, were that they, like, cut hair and did nails and, and did makeup. They were cos, cosmetology people. And they, they were kind of pooling their energy and going, like, how, how could we tell a different story to these prostitutes? And several years ago, what they came up with was that every Valentine's Day, they would rent a very large venue, and they would cut hair and do nails and do makeup for any prostitute that would show up. Uh, not with an overt message of the gospel, but with a subtle, like, just want you to know that God's available and he cares. It's this thing that happens a year after year as they just use their vocation to tell God's story. See, I'm not necessarily talking this morning about like getting yourself a Christian coffee mug. You can. I'm not even necessarily suggesting that you should start a Bible study at lunch. Maybe. But like what opportunities are there because of the relationships you have and the skills that you have? Heard of one gal uh, who at 25 years old had a PhD in physics and very quickly realized that, that in that echelon of the sciences, and this is a local story, a uh, narrate story really, um, in that level of the sciences, that there, aren't, there aren't very many women. That when you get to the PhD level of the sciences, it's mostly men. And she had this passion for demonstrating to girls, elementary, junior high, and high school, that you can be a woman, and you can have long fingernails, and you can be girly girl, or you can not be girly girl, and you can be a PhD in biology. And so she started a deal uh, called Chicks Dig Science. And she pooled together all these scientists, and it's kind of a big deal now. And it's just a place where girls come and they see uh, women who are professional scientists in several different ways. And it's just telling a different story. Heard of a guy who is remarkable at math, intuitive, he might say, who volunteers at a local school for an hour a week to just tutor kids who are behind in math. Heard a story about a gal who uh, is particularly good at grammar and English. And so she's tutoring me now. Just kidding. Um, but and she, she's, she's doing the same thing. In fact, C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien were a part of a group. Anybody got a warrant? Um, they were part of a group that gathered, six or seven of them. And I, I can't even remember what they called the group. They had a name for it. Uh, Society Room, I think is what they called it. And they just have these conversations of how could we pool our occupational skill to tell a different story about Jesus to our community? Like how could we use what we already have? Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, heard of her? Beecher, not Beatrice, Beecher. Uh, She, from a very early age, was quite proficient at writing, one of those kind of golden-tongued type of people. In fact, um, so much so that she went on to to use that incredibly. What happened in her life was that when, when, uh, when the president, when he passed a law called the Fugitive Slave Act, that made it illegal for people in the north to harbor and help slaves who had fled from the south to find their freedom. Uh, it became, a, you know, that was the culture long before the Civil War, where slaves knew if we could get to the north, uh, they'll help us. They'll help us get into Canada, they'll, help, they'll hide us, whatever the case may be. When that law was passed, Harriet's sister wrote her a letter. And as the biographer recalls, her sister, uh, the letter was written by her sister, And as her sister and her family, Harriet and her family, excuse me, were sitting in a parlor. Don't know what a parlor is. Do you have a parlor? I think you smoke a pipe in a parlor. Like, you have to. I'm not sure. But you sit in a wingback chair. As she was sitting there with her family and this letter was read, and her sister addressed her directly and she said, Harriet, if I could write like you can write, I would write something that exposed the evil of slavery. The the result was, according to the biographer, uh, taking the story from Harriet's uh, child, that Harriet immediately stood up from her chair, put her pipe down, just kidding, um, (laughs) and said, I will write something. If I will live, I will write. She left the room and literally at that moment started to write uh, a book that came to be called Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
one of the most profound books, one of the most catalytic books written in that time that historians point to as being a major cause of the start of the Civil War and the eventual abolishment of slavery. At one point, her movement had, was, was, uh, she had, was a part of a, a leader of a movement of 500,000 women, many of whom from uh, the United States, the majority of whom from places like England and Ireland and general Europe, greater Europe. Later, uh, having been the catalyst for the Civil War in many ways, Abraham Lincoln wrote something that, that Harriet happened upon. He said this. Uh, this will mess with your U.S. history, by the way. My paramount object in this struggle, speaking of the Civil War, is to save the Union. And it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. Harriet heard that and responded by using her platform a little differently. She responded by saying, my paramount object in this struggle is to set at liberty them that are abused and not either to save or destroy the Union. What I do in favor of the Union, I do because it helps to free the oppressed. What I forbear, I forbear because it does not help to free the oppressed. I shall do less for the Union whenever it would hurt the cause of the slave and more when I believe it would help the cause of the slave. Right? There's a little kung fu going on there. <laughs> the result was she was invited to the White House where historians tell us the conversation that ensued between herself and the then President Abraham Lincoln and his wife uh, changed his perspective. It was ultimately fleshed out for him in a very famous speech that he gave after the Civil War. My question is, uh, you know, in sports we talk about leaving points on the field. In, in financial terms, we talk about leaving money in the t on the table. I guess I just want to provoke you a little bit this morning to, to wonder uh, what opportunities are left on the table for the kingdom? Like, what if your vocation was in play? Uh, Dallas Willard, in my view, one of the most provoking uh, Christian thinkers alive today, a professor of philosophy at USC who loves Jesus and is remarkable at talking about discipleship. I heard him this week, uh, which you only listen to him when you need to be wrecked, you know? So I was listening to him this week, and, and he defined integrity this way. He said, integrity, it's when all the pieces of your life fit together. When all the different roles when who you are when you surf the internet and who you are when you form a budget and who you are on Sunday morning and who you are as a father and who you are as a mother, when everything fits together into one whole. I guess that's where I'm thinking with vocation. Because see, the temptation is to go, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not Harriet. Like, I'm not going to write the next famous song. And in fact, it might be really healthy for you to acknowledge that. I'm not going to be the next person to do something fabulous that gets me invited to the president's house. Adam, I'm kind of a one-talent dude. And that might come from a place of self-hatred. Or uh, you might be like me and you go like, no, that's just kind of, I don't know, self-awareness. Maybe you're not delusional. Like you're not the greatest thing that's happened, you know, since Abraham Lincoln or Harriet. And the tendency then becomes to go like, okay, this is really easy for doctors. This is really easy uh, for nurses. This is really easy for the wealthy, whatever. But it's not relevant. I mean, I'm a barista. I'm a student. Adam, I'm in sixth grade. You're talking about jobs. I've been sleeping for 20 minutes. Like, like I'm, on a, I'm on a football team. I don't, I don't have a job. Or, or maybe there's this one. Adam, I'm a parent. And I stay at home. And I'm not ashamed of that. But this isn't relevant. Well, maybe it would help to shift it from the what to just thinking about time. Because, see, the deal is this, that no matter what you do, whether you're a parent or you're a barista, chances are that from that occupational standpoint, you spend the majority of your time doing that thing. If you're an engineer, if you're an accountant, whatever it is you do, the majority of your time when you subtract sleep is probably spent doing that. Which raises this question. Uh, is your kingdom bringing a hobby or is it a lifestyle? And that can feel a little bit like a bony finger in the chest, and that's not my intention, though I do think maybe we need to be provoked a little bit. Uh, because if, if the majority of our time spent were living without kingdom mindset, which for most of us is work, then it would mean that it's, it's a hobby. It's something we do when we have extra time. See, maybe the what isn't the issue. But maybe the bigger issue is the who, not the band because they did a really bad halftime performance a couple years ago. But, but, but the who? Because no matter what your occupation, whether it's your dream occupation or not, and we'll get to that, 
Uh, you're surrounded by people. And, and the kingdom, it, it, it's not about medicine, and it's not about law, and it's not about making money, and, and it's not about coffee, and it's, it's, it's not about any of that stuff. It's not even about this. It's not about church. It's about people. Which means that you have all kinds of opportunity, even if it's, um, I don't know, virtual. Jesus, uh, I think we're barely touching the Bible this morning, and so if you like lots of Bible, then see us next week because James is going to unpack the Word. Right, James? <laughs> like chapters upon chapters upon chapters, exegetical. I mean, it is valid biblical teaching that he's going to do. No pressure, James. Um, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. So if you're uh, roaming the halls and you're nice to the people that everyone else is nice to, whoop-de-doo, right? And if you could do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Sure it would seem like work might give us a lot of opportunity there. Remember that guy Zacchaeus? Remember the wee little man, the wee little man was he. We could all sing the song. Um, there's birds in here. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was healthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, so God loves short people, uh, he could not see the, over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. That's the TNIV, sorry. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And now what happens in the text is we have a timeline being condensed, right? Because the next statement is, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. To which Jesus responded, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what is lost. I don't fancy myself a Bible scholar. Uh, but you know, that's the only place in the Gospels that Jesus makes that statement. It's the only place where he says, today salvation has come to this house. Notice that it's not in response to this uh, really tight theological expose about Jesus' divine nature. It's, it's not uh, in response to a tract that we get on our windshield every Sunday afternoon. It's not in response to any of that. It's, it's actually in response to a guy who takes his understanding of grace and quickly translates it to his occupation, to his vocation. And I don't know, all we can do is speculate, but I can't help but wonder if Jesus didn't understand that Zacchaeus' world was the same as our world, that where he spent the majority of his life was collecting taxes. And if that redemption, if that grace was going to translate to that sphere of his life, then he must get it. Isn't it interesting that like, he didn't tell Zacchaeus to stop collecting taxes? Instead, he inspired him to collect them differently, justly, fairly. And which the same could be true of the healings in the Gospels, right? You, you don't see Jesus going like, hey, good job, you're healed. Now go be in the circus. He, he's, go, good job, you're healed. Now go back from where you came is the majority response. Enter back into that same world. What if your occupation, what if your vocation what if it was in play? I think one of the tendencies, I know I have it, is, is what I call the tomorrow, yesterday complex. Uh, my, my oldest, my youngest son, excuse me, is at this place where he can't quite understand the difference, like yesterday, tomorrow, today, all those words kind of confuse him. And the other day I said, uh, hey, Justice, do you wanna, what if we painted tonight? And he said, um, is tonight today? Because <laughs> he's so sick of being confused by, okay, what day are we talking about? I always tell him free gum tomorrow, and he hasn't figured that out yet. Anyway. Okay. Tomorrow. Yesterday. Uh, I mean, isn't this, when we talk about physical exercise? I exercised yesterday. I'll exercise tomorrow, so I cannot today. Uh, when it comes to so many things that we know should be priorities. Like, uh, I'll do something to feed my soul, my relationship with the Lord. I'll pray, I'll read something, I'll go for a walk. I'll do that tomorrow, and I did it yesterday. I'm just too busy today. Uh, it's why experts tell us that someone who's not generous with a $10,000 a year income won't be with a million dollar a year income. Because uh, if we're not today, we won't be tomorrow, even if we're so uh, confused as to think that we were yesterday. Which is a subject Jesus addressed. Um, I, I think one of my very favorite principles that Jesus unfolds, whoever can be trusted with very little 
can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I know there's a dream job out there for a bunch of you. And for some of you, the dream, it's nothing against your kids, but the dream is to like to have a job. Like, I know there's the dream degree. I know when you get to that level, then you're going to serve in your vocation like nobody's business. Jesus would say, well, start with being a barista. Start with being a seventh grader in the junior high. Like, because if you're not faithful with those opportunities, you won't be with the others either. Scott McKnight, I think, very astutely points out that as Americans, we want four things from a job. And I think this is okay, that, that we, want, we want to make a lot of money, particularly if we come from a middle-class background, that we want a job that will bring us a lot of joy and yet will also be very, very challenging, that, that we want a job that matters, that makes a difference in the world in which we live, that's about more than just, you know, the here and the now paying my bills, and that we want a job that brings us more and more satisfaction as our pr- career unfolds. I guess my challenge to to, to many of us is that's great. Have goals, pursue dreams, but don't put everything on pause until you arrive there. Because the principle of Jesus is if you do that, you'll have a really bad habit and it won't be easily broken. You know, it's a calculated risk to say, man, if you want to split firewood with this, awesome. If you want to run media, we have a need for that. Super but not at the expense of having a full presence at work, not at the expense of being fully present among the people that you work with. And I think Paul would sum this up best when he says, "In whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, the way that you say thanks for the cross is, is to do things the way Jesus would do them if he were you. And I think if we're going to be a community built on a principle of organic kingdom bringing, we, we have to start with where we spend the majority of our time, which for most of us is a job. Now, if you're someone that's checking Jesus out, uh, confused, intrigued, maybe been checking him out for, for days, weeks, months, years, uh, I, I would summarize the gospel this morning this way, by saying Jesus rescues us, so many of those songs this morning talked about. He rescues us from our sin. It's not about earning, it's about receiving. But what's of paramount importance in my view is that you would understand that he doesn't rescue you to save you to religion. He doesn't rescue you to save you to church. He doesn't rescue you to save you to a bunch of religious stuff. He rescues you to transform you and to put you back where you came from with a different presence, with a different priority, with a different set of eyes. And all those spiritual practices that they're not holy unto themselves. They're all designed to put you back in your context because God is a God who says everything's in play and everything's in play because I have my people everywhere. Let me just pray over you and give you a moment to reflect uh, with God. So let's close up in prayer. First, just take a moment, talk to God about whatever it is you might be thinking and then I'll wrap us up. Lord, I pray that from this community would would be the best employees in town. That we would be a people uh, who are servant-hearted, not just in the context of our community, not just in the context of our church, uh, but, but that we would have this reputation of selflessness among those that we work that you'd make us astute, God, that you would help us uh, to, to see the needs among coworkers, among those that uh, we share space with every day, among classmates, among teammates. God, that we would see through a, a lot of the posturing and see real needs. And that you'd help us to find time in our schedules to, to meet those needs. God, we're so grateful that your kingdom is such a practical thing. That you're not someone that... Uh, removes people from culture, but actually makes culture better by transforming the very people that are yours. Thanks, God, that we live uh, in a world where everything's in play and we get to follow you as you lead us into whatever corner you have for us. 
We sure love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.